So, hi, this is Kim Grennan. This is another episode of Mommy Cosm Reviews. Um, what I, yep, <laughs> want to give her a little disclaimer that we've switched things around with the background here, um, and I cringed when I clicked the camera on live tonight because um, my lighting's a little off. So I apologize for that. I hope it doesn't bother anybody there. It's probably a detail thing that annoys me and nobody else notices. Um, but before I get any emails saying, hey, your lighting was awful this week, <laughs> which could happen, um, I'm well aware. Thanks. Don't need to know. Um, very excited for this episode. We have one of the authors of Good Enough is the New Perfect. Um, I met Holly, and I'm going to show you a picture of the two authors here. And I'm a little scattered tonight. I'm still coming from softball, so I'm going to, it's going to take a minute to find my rhythm. I apologize. <laughs> um, the authors of Good Enough is the New Perfect um, are Becky Beaupre Gillespie and Holly Schwartz Temple. Um, I met Holly at Blistem, and she actually spoke at one of the panels that I was at and mentioned her book and totally resonated with me, let me tell you. Um, it's Finding Happiness in, in Success in Modern mother Motherhood, and I could identify with so many of the women whose stories they told in the book. So let's give a big shout out and a big welcome to Holly. Thank you so much. So, is there anyone watching? <laughs> there is. Yeah, there's oh, good. there is. <laughs> there's people hello. there. And there's th see there we go. They'll say hello. Some of them are shy in the chat room. Some of them aren't so shy. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. I I will ask you questions that they are going to ask you, but I'd like to start off, you know, I know this book has been a long time in coming for you. You've been working yeah. on it for a while, very hard. Um, and it's just released now. So tell me a little bit about the process, um, what started the process of the book and how the two of you managed to hook up to write together. So in 2007, Becky and I got back in touch. We had been sorority sisters and we had worked together at the Daily Northwestern in college. And uh, Becky was at that time trying to figure out what she wanted to do as she was making her segue from at-home mom to something else. And at that point, she had decided she wanted to try a network marketing business uh, selling skincare products, which sort of surprised me when I first heard about it. But Becky is very driven and I knew whatever she did, she was was going to make a success of it and so she called me because I was in her network of possible uh, customers and at the time she hit me right by a birthday and of course I bought like $300 worth of, <laughs> of anti-aging creams from her and we talked for a while about what her plans were and what turned out that she decided that the skincare business wasn't what she was really invested in. But as we talked we realized that the issues that we were both having as um, moms who wanted to have some sort of career and also have a lot of time at home, uh, we were struggling with the same issues. And as we talked, we realized that there was not yet a book that really spoke to us and spoke to, excuse me, to our generation of moms. There were some lighter books out there with some tips and some sort of dated materials, but nothing that really captured our generation of moms at this moment in time. There was no manual or guidebook that really made sense to us. So to make a long story short, we decided we had to write it. Um, the, and I'm from your generation also. <laughs> so um, one thing that really resonated with me has to do with the whole, our generation was brought up to be told, you can do anything, you can be anything. So when we got to be adults, we expected that we could do and be everything to everyone right. <laughs> and do it all perfectly. <laughs> and I, for one, felt like a huge failure in the beginning of motherhood because I realized, you know, I, I, I was laid off when I was three months pregnant and said, oh, well, that's okay. I was just going to, you know, I was going to stay home for a while anyway. <laughs> and then I felt like I lost me. I had seriously had a breakdown at one point because... Not a huge one, but I, I remember just crying, which isn't my normal M.O., and just being like I gave up my name, I gave up, you know, <laughs> I gave up my career, I gave up everything, and what am I doing? And I'm not even doing that well because my daughter was mean to me that day or something, you know. <laughs> it was just, it was really hard. It was a learning curve, and I really enjoyed reading some of the stories in here um, because there's so many of me out there. <laughs> so... 
It's it's and great. Isn't that comforting it's to very see comforting. that you're not that you're not alone. That was one of the reasons mm-hmm. we wanted to write this book because we had so many moms uh, expressing the same emotions, just like what you just said, Kim. How they felt, you know, despair, depressed, all sorts of emotions. A lot, of, I think, coming from the demands that they were putting on mm-hmm. themselves, and and also just the demands of new motherhood. I mean, that is a very stressful, physically demanding time. Mm-hmm. But what we kept hearing again and again was, "I feel so alone. No one else is doing it the way I am." And we wanted to show moms that. First of all, you are not alone. Mm-hmm. All of us have been there. We have gone through it. It's just that we don't talk about these things. Work-life balance issues have, for a very long time, been considered to be a, a private issue that we shouldn't talk about in public, sort of a hush-hush sort of thing. And we don't think that's good for anyone. And so we wanted to write this book so that we could say to moms, you're not alone. There are so many moms out there who are trying to do things that are similar to what you're doing. You just don't hear about it. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to put it all out there so people would feel less alone and more affirmed in their choices. It's awesome. I think anybody who is a mom of small children, any new moms, I think they would really enjoy reading this. Um, even moms from other generations that, you know, could kind of read about what, you know, the plights are that we go through. Because I think our generation is unique. Um, you know, yes. my, my favorite t-shirt, I was talking, I had your book with me down in Charleston, South Carolina last weekend with, when I was visiting my dad for his 60th birthday. And, you know, we actually had like a conversation we've never had before. Because something got brought up about, there's two things about me. <laughs> that are funny that my favorite t-shirt that I remember having when I was little was anything boys can do girls can do better yes and I firmly <laughs> believe that to this day I it, you know because <laughs> you know I wore the t-shirt so it kind of through osmosis became a mantra for me um now I know that's not necessarily true we all have you know our strengths and weaknesses <laughs> so but I, I I strove to be perfect and to be better and had felt like I was proving myself and anybody that tells me I can't do something that's a double dog dare to me oh boy like you can't do that Kim (laughs) you know try me (laughs) so watch me watch me do it (laughs) so um and my dad told me that he used to tell me when I was little and I, I don't remember this but it had to have really had an impact because he said do you remember me telling you you can't do that you're a girl I was like, oh, oh, no. wow, oh. <laughs> no, I don't remember that, but that explains a lot. <laughs> so it was, it was really funny. Um, well, I, you're, you're, not, Kim, you're not the first one to tell me that this has generated some conversation uh, intergenerationally. Um, I did a talk down in Parkersburg, West Virginia a few weeks ago, and it was mostly baby boomers who were there, and they were just as into the subject as the Gen X moms who we sort of had envisioned as our target audience. These uh, baby boomers uh, said to me, oh, I get it now. I understand my daughter. I understand these pressures that she's putting on herself. And so we definitely had that. And the other um, relationship that we've been, uh, or the other relationship that the book seems to be uh, focused on are are marriages. And we've had Mm -hmm. a lot of women tell us that they had conversations with their husbands after reading the book, that things that they hadn't discussed openly, they felt like, they, you know, now sort of had a platform to talk about it, and that mm-hmm. made us feel really good. Because I feel if you make the choice to be a stay-at-home mom and you've given up what could be a successful career for yourself, that a lot of people f- look at you like you gave up something and you're giving up a piece of you. To And I think it's an internal thing more than it's an external thing. That oh yeah, people that aren't entirely comfortable with that decision, but they feel like it's the best thing, and they feel like it's a huge sacrifice to do that. Um, they kind of wear that energy, and other people pick up on it about them. I think so too, and I, I think it's very difficult for women, um, particularly women who have had careers that they're very proud of. You know, Becky talks about how when at, when she was on her six year leave at home that. Uh, she, when people would ask her what she did, she always talked about what she used to do. You know, Mm -hmm. she never started off the conversation by saying what she was doing at at home. Mm -hmm. And she thinks it was, you know, kind of a a subconscious thing, but she, she didn't want people to dismiss her as someone who didn't have any professional ambition because she, because she did, it was just the right move for her at that time. Exactly. 
I remember saying I used to be Kim Vickers, who is an event planner and worked down in Boston and did all these fabulous things. Now I'm a stay at home <laughs> mom in, you know, Rochester, New Hampshire. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. you know, I, I, ident- I had that identify what I did was identifying who I was. Mm-hmm. And that's, it's not right. Uh, it's not the right way of looking at it. So, yeah. I think it's very common, though. It is. It is. It is. And you feel guilty talking about it, which is why I love this, because you feel guilty because, you you know, you feel like you're the only one who's having this problem. So, like you said, it's starting conversations and letting everybody know they're not alone at all. So, I have a question. I I think that's even... Oh, yes. Go Go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. You think that's even what... Um, Well, I was just going... Uh, to say, you know, I, I think it's just important that we, you know, we have this conversation and that we let women know that uh, one of the reasons that we're having all, I think that there's so much angst right now is that we don't have those great lines we used to have, you know, where it was the at-home moms in one camp versus the career moms in another camp. Mm-hmm. There are so many shades of gray that we're working in today. You know, I have a friend who lives in Urbana, Illinois, and she's working as an editor for a New York publication. She just telecommutes and, you know, other moms in her neighborhood might not quite understand what she's doing. <laughs> and, you know, she feels like she's the only one doing it that way. But there, there's somebody else who actually is. It's just we're not having the conversation. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really led to what we call the, the new mommy war. It's this battle that we that we wage in our own heads where we're exactly. constantly questioning ourselves. We're not at battle with anybody else but ourselves. So (laughs) that's what it comes down to. Um, I totally relate to that. Um, because I, I'm no longer, I I don't call myself a stay at home mom anymore. And I wonder why that is because I do, I always say stay and work at home. Um, because I have my own business now. Um, mommy Cosm is an LLC and you know, I'm starting to make a little money guys. So (laughs) it's a good thing doing, doing contract work. So, um, you know, I'm busy very busy and I do it all from home. I sometimes have to travel, which is something that, um, I struggle with because I justify and I, I, I actually have the kid's doctor. All right. We're going to tell a quick story. (laughs) My, my daughter was sick last week. She had strep. I was at my daughter, my dad's 60th birthday and I flew, literally flew back and came straight from the airport to to meet my husband at the doctor's because, of course, mom is responsible for doctor's visits, right? Dad's not allowed to do that, right? My husband would gladly do it and did gladly do it and stepped right up to the plate. He's fabulous, but I have this stigma that I'm a bad mom if mom's not there. Well, I, w- uh. <laughs> <laughs> I wigged out because when I took my daughter to do a urine test in the bathroom, the doctor started asking if Casey has anxiety because mommy's away. Does mommy travel a lot? And we're still talking about this. And I know she didn't mean anything about it. She was trying to delve into my daughter's anxieties and not say that I'm a bad person. But I seriously took offense and was like, is she saying I'm a bad mother because I traveled alone without my kids? And, you know, I struggled to get here and, you know. Well, so. <laughs> I think we're dealing with, you know, a lot of preconceived notions mm-hmm. there about who should be doing what. And one of the things we learned from the book, I really took a lot away from this, but the parenting experts talked about if you want to share in the parenting, if you want to share in the joy of parenting and all the decision making, uh, you, you have to share the power. Mm-hmm. And that means that, you know, if mom is away, that dad has to be willing and able, you know, to handle the doctor yep. and mom has to be okay with that. Mm-hmm. That's the thing. That's where a it's lot a of the moms step thing. Up. A lot of the dads are okay with that. It's the yes, moms are. <laughs> aren't able to give, give away control, you know, going exactly. to Blistem, your actual speak, your talk that the, um, session, yeah, panel, yeah. <laughs> there you go, that you were in sparked a conversation that I had with somebody else about, the way that different people left their families. I literally walked away and said, Hey, you know, here's a few things on the calendar that you need to note. And we're to that point that I was able to do that and let it go and wash my hands and be like, you're in charge. Other people like, you know, cooked ahead for the week and left things frozen. And, you know, thing, this has to be done this and this and this and a big detailed letter. And I remember when my daughter was a baby, the first time I left her, that's the way I felt. I had to tell him exactly what to do when or else, <laughs> you know, and if he didn't do it, it was bad. But, you know, good enough 
<laughs> for me was letting go and saying he's a great parent. He can handle this. I don't need to. So. And, and that's what the experts told us is really the way to do it. If you if you want to share, if you want your partner to contribute equally, or however you decide is right for you, you you can't be the queen bee at the same time. <laughs> so you're going to have to you know you. Uh, give some of that power away mm -hmm. and I've actually found that to be really freeing uh -huh. and uh, not that I not that I always do it perfectly and I, I was just talking to my husband I'm going to be away next week for the book and I was suggesting to him that there are some things going on that I wanted him to take you know the kids to and he should do it this way and he said Holly if, you're, if I'm going to be in charge let me be in charge and I thought okay you're right you know I need mm -hmm. to share that with you and if I'm leaving you in charge then clearly you should do it your way exactly yep and that's such a hard I'm, I'm glad to be in that place that I can step back now and say you're yep mm-hmm <laughs> it, I, I think it's very difficult particularly if the mom has been the one at home taking care of all the details and then when there are those transitional times everybody has to transition so, and, and we, we have a chapter in the book about that, our um, chapter on career makeovers and reentry. Mm -hmm. You know, there are a lot of moms that stay home for a significant period of time and then decide that they want to move back into some sort of paying position. And, and they could be doing it like you are, Kim, you know, sort of starting as a, as a consultant and then, you know, contracting, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Or, you know, they don't always jump back in full time. And everybody in the family has to get on board. Mm -hmm. And that's what some of our experts talk about in that career chapter, that um, that's a very important thing for everyone in the family to feel invested and for them to understand why the mom wants to make this change mm -hmm. and for them to get behind it. And I still firmly believe that if mom's not happy, nobody is in the family. Um yeah, I completely agree. As, you know, getting rid of other stereotypes, that one I think is always going to exist. And I think mom needs to be doing something, whether it be part-time, full-time, or just a hobby. Something that nurtures their soul and makes them feel important and smart outside of the family. So I, I, I agree. I think yeah. that for a lot of women, I, for, for all women, they have to have... I think that the women, we, I can say that pretty much, we've proven that through our study that, you know, we, we mm -hmm. interviewed more than 900 women from 43 states, and mm -hmm. they all told us rather emphatically that, you know, they wanted to value themselves, they wanted to do things for themselves, but oftentimes it was their perfectionism or their notions mm -hmm. about what they should be doing that got in the way of their happiness. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, the book is fabulous. I, I Seriously, oh, the first day I got it, I, I ripped it open. It was at the bus stop, and I didn't want to put it down. Um, and then I picked it back up later when I actually had time, and I, I finished <laughs> reading it through on the plane um, a couple weekends ago. And just I, I absolutely love it. It speaks not only to our generation, like I said, but I think other generations get an insight into the craziness that's us. <laughs> and so explains things a lot in a way that we might not have the words for. Um, so, oh, I'm so glad to hear you say that. Thank you so much. So tell people how they can get the book now. So the book is now available. It is in bookstores nationwide. So we're sort of in our soft launch week. It, our official date uh, is April 26th. But they, from what I understand, people have been out. You know, we have our teams out all over the country. My brother just bought one in California. Oh, I'm here in West Virginia. They're they're at they're out there at the stores at Barnes and Noble. Um, there is also available on Amazon. If you go to thenewperfect.com, our website, uh, it'll lead you right to Amazon. Uh, I see somebody here. Yes, asking they want to know about book signings. <laughs> <laughs> this is yes. really interactive so, show. <laughs> I see that. And she told me not to look down. Sorry, I'm not trying no, to. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> so uh, we have our launch events are in Illinois next week. We're going to be in Urbana, Illinois on Wednesday, uh, April 27th with the Shambana Moms. So we're looking forward to that event. And then on Friday, um, I think that's the 29th, if I have my dates right. Do I have that right? Um Someone tell me if I'm wrong. Um, today's 19. Uh, yes. I like have yes. my calendar. Can I, yes. yes. So I'm sorry. I, <laughs> no. I'm, so Kim, I, cannot, I cannot see anything without my reading glasses, especially <laughs> at night. Um, so, right. So on the 29th, we'll be in Chicago. Um, and then the next week, we're going to 
and, and we have uh, an event on Friday and on, and on Sunday in Chicago. All of these events are under the events tab at the new, the new Great. I was going to ask that. Awesome. Somebody from Urbana. Are you coming to Urbana? I would love to see you out there. Um, Nebraska, we don't have anything yet, but we are booking, uh, we're currently booking speaking engagements. So if you know of any corporations or um, law firms are bringing us in, we, we need somebody to, you know, to get us out there. Uh, but uh, we're, you know, we're open to going almost anywhere because we really want to spread the message, you know, about good enough is the new perfect. Um, the week after next will be in Morgantown, West Virginia my hometown on May 5th. Uh, we're having a great celebration of women event at 630. Uh, and it's sponsored by a magazine, West Virginia Living. And then Friday night, uh, we're going to be in Pittsburgh for a mom blogger event uh, put on by the motherhood, our friends Cooper oh, cool. and Emily. Uh, so we'll be there. Uh, so we'll be in Pittsburgh. And then I, uh, I have a couple more events coming up over the summer. Um, I'm going to be in Sacramento. I'm going to be in Baton Rouge, uh, be back in Chicago, so we're just, we're starting to line these up and, you know, people can contact us. Our speaking and contact information is also available at the newperfect.com. Awesome. So again, the events page, it's a, there, is there a tab at the top that says events? I think so. Okay. okay. So look <laughs> for the events page on the newperfect.com. Um, and as new events are added, I'm sure that you can find them there or you can see where they're already going to be and see if it's near you. Yes. You're, so. Yeah. Under the speaking tab up on the, on the top, um, under speaking, there's okay. a sub tab for upcoming events and it has our whole schedule. Okay. Fabulous. Well, I wish you the best of luck. Um, really excited to Thank see this so take much. off for you. So well, we, we really appreciate the opportunity and we hope that your listener uh, your viewers enjoyed it too and that they'll tell their friends about Good Enough is the New Perfect. We really want to have a grassroots movement of moms spreading the word. Awesome. I'm going to ask my the chat room um, quickly. Do you have any quick questions that you would like Holly to answer? Um, we might be able to twist her arm for her to stick around for a few to t type in things. Oh, absolutely. I will stay on. Okay, I'm seeing thank yous. Thank you so much. I don't see any questions, so I'm going to let you go. Thank okay. you so much. Take care. Thank you, Kim. I appreciate it. Okay, let's see. I need to figure out the tech aspect of this and let her go off from Skype as well. Maybe we'll see her in the chat room in a bit. So, awesome. I, I have been really looking forward to doing an interview with her for a while because really, truly, it was it was one of my favorite panels. Um, and it wasn't, it didn't, I didn't expect for it to be one of my favorites. I thought it would be a good one, but... You know, I was more into other sessions with, like, monetization and stuff like that, and that one, it was really cool. Um, seeing, I'm a bookaholic and love seeing new books I haven't read. Uh, me too. I love to read, and I love it when a book grabs me, and this one did. And it's a real book, um, nonfiction, <laughs> so that doesn't happen often. Um, so let's chat. Um, anybody have any questions, comments, concerns, anything you want to share about your own life? I did see somebody start to tell a story up here about my husband. Let me go back up and see who that was. Um, my husband felt the same way and he was a part-time stay-at-home dad. He felt like people were looking down at him for caring for our kid. But I felt equally sad because I couldn't be a stay-at-home mom. I just, you know, why are we all so hard on each other? Yeah, novel novelista, hi. Why are we so hard on each other? I just, I don't, I don't understand it. And I'm kind of getting beyond that. I still have my moments, but I'm much better now and much less of a perfectionist. Um, and I, after reading this book, I have to say, good enough, good enough. <laughs> and so it's kind of, uh, yes. So I do have a book. Holly did say that we could give away a book this evening. So if anybody in the chat room would like to read the book and get a free copy, um, be you know, before the official launch date of it, um, the rules for the, the giveaway here is the first person to appear in my chat stream with the correct answer will be named the winner. And I say my chat stream only because I want to um, make sure that it, it's fair and fun and I'm not entirely sure, especially after our technical difficulties last week, um, I'm not entirely sure if our chat sinks. So, you guys ready for the question? I need to see some yeses in there. Mm -hmm. I see one, yep. Okay, you guys are ready. Here's the question. And I tried to make it relevant with a statistic um, from the book. So, 
Okay, so yeah, I need to make this bigger because I can't see tonight. In 1997, nearly 71% of college educated mothers with infants worked. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which was a statistic that was shared in, in on the website actually um, for the New Perfect, um, what was that number in 2004? So it was 71% in 1997. What did it become by the time 2004 rolled around? And let's see. I have 23, 15, 14, 76, 82, 80. I'm going to tell you it's a whole number um, just because I know this could go on all night. We've experienced that before. So it was rough. It was nearly 71%. Um, it's a whole, it's a number that starts with zero. And here we go. I see a winner. Um, Novelista is the winner. So way to go. I'm seeing, yay, Novelista. Um, so what I need for you to do, my dear, and let's just prove that the answer was 60%. Um, what I need for you to do is email me, please. Um, those of you that are new to the chat room, this is softball season for me. I coach high school softball. So in addition to the craziness that I've been doing producing the motherhood's events, um, I'm also a high school softball coach, which means every single afternoon I'm on a softball field for two, three, four hours. Um, I have an iPhone now to help me keep up, but I am really um, brain dead. <laughs> so there's no other way of saying it. Um, so I need you to email me as a reminder, and we'll have that log in there, and I'll, I will get your address over to Holly for you. Thank you, Holly, for um, coming on for an interview. And I again, I wish her the best of luck with her book. And I think all you guys would benefit from reading it, even if you don't have children. Um, it truly does speak to my generation and our perfectionism needs and our abilities to be kinder to ourselves.